Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to putting new life into old assets, the engineering challenges in oil refinery turnarounds. Uh, there's a 40 minute presentation to be, uh, to be put, uh, projected now, after which, during which you can submit questions on the submit a question box, which we will then uh, answer as many of the questions as possible at the end of it. Uh, so hopefully it's an enjoyable experience watching this and we can have some good uh, questions at the end of it. Uh, thank you very much and speak to you later. Welcome to putting life into old assets, the engineering challenges in oil refinery turnarounds. Successful turnarounds are a product of getting the right people in the right time with the right materials and the right work methods. Sending them home in one piece at the end of their shift and leaving behind a safe and reliable improved process plant. So for those of you new to turnarounds, I should give a short explanation of turnarounds. They're often referred to as overhauls, outages, shutdowns, and this is often abbreviated to TA, TAR, TNI, INT, and there's many, many more, where the I in the TNI is actually for inspection. Oil and gas process plants operate continuously 24 hours per day, 365 days per year. Turnarounds are when these plants are shut down for their major service. In oil refining, these are every three to six years depending on the type of process unit. During the turnaround process, units are shut down. All the hydrocarbons and chemicals are removed. The equipment is opened and dismantled. It is then cleaned, inspected, repaired, or modified as required. The equipment is then reassembled, closed up, and the plant is re restarted by reintroducing the hydrocarbons and commencing the operation again. Now I should go on to introduce myself. I'm a Charles Mechanical Engineer. I've worked 31 years in heavy industrial asset management and maintenance, the last 26 years of which have been in onshore oil, gas and chemical turnaround management. Our agenda for today will be to start with an exploration of the challenges in turnaround management. I will then outline some examples of those challenges I've encountered in oil refinery turnarounds, and then I'll quickly cover the opportunities for engineers in turnaround management after which there will be a short question and answer session. So looking at the historic turnarounds, the majority of turnarounds in the industry were essentially what was called an open, clean and inspect event. The driving force of the turnaround being the requirement to inspect the equipment for legal inspection requirements and reliability. In some catalyst-based processes, where the catalyst has a finite life and degrades with time and usage, the motivation for turnarounds is often the need to change the catalyst. There's also often a need to clean out the plant, because the process often fouls up and leads to operational restrictions and efficiency losses. These can often be one of the main drivers for the turnaround in the old historic ways. Now, moving on to the... Uh, the actual structure of a historic turnarounds, you would always find that they were considered uh, to be mainly a, a maintenance event, where only maybe 10% of the associated work would be to do with making improvements or modifications to the plant. Many of these would be minor changes and could easily be completed alongside the open, clean, and inspect scope. These modifications would not normally be considered major tasks. For a normal open up and clean and inspect turnaround, the planning period would be typically 12 months long, uh, during which time materials would be ordered, job methods would be developed, and the work would be prepared. The execution period for these turnarounds would typically be between three and five weeks, depending on the type of unit and the complexity of the turnaround. What was quite fundamental about these is the vast majority of the work, the planning, the preparation, and the execution could be led by technically trade-skilled personnel 
because the work was essentially stripping down and rebuilding of existing equipment, and it was rebuilt to exactly the same design as previously operated. As a qualified engineer on these turnarounds, your contribution, contribution to the process would include often the overall management event, the coordination of the work scope development, writing the job list, leadership of the planning and preparation period to ensure the milestones are met, leadership of the actual event, generally keeping things well organized and invariably cost and commercial control was also with the responsibility of the engineer. As such, the technical engineering skills requir requirements were somewhat overshadowed by the organization, leadership, and commercial skills required. This is one of the main reasons why turnaround management was never seen as an attractive career route for the vast majority of qualified mechanical engineers. However, even in these simple turnarounds, there were still some interesting challenges for engineers, often quite frustrating ones. One such example out of my career is after being proactive pre-turnaround and purchasing a brand new bundle for an ex to reduce the risks because the existing bundle was considered to be corroded. When carrying out the shell side hydro test, this is what happened. The vendor had failed to correctly roll the tubes after manufacture, and obviously what was, what was the result was a, a shower. Now, as an engineer, to mobilize the contractor site to rectify their error, follow up later with an identify the failures in the quality assurance, Definitely required some engineering skills, but more importantly, required the calm personality of a turnaround engineer. Now, moving on to our more, more recent style of turnarounds, we now have a much different style. The main focus of many turnarounds that I've been involved with recently is to refurbish, improve, and modify the plants. During these turnouts, you also need to complete the traditional open, clean, and inspect work scope. Now, the drivers for these modified modification-type turnarounds are extending the life of aged assets. Many UK and European refinery process units were built in the 1980s, so are becoming somewhat aged. It's quite common for process plants to have a design life of 100,000 hours, which is less than 12 years of continuous operation. So many pieces of equipment are approaching three times this design life. Remnant life assessments are carried out regularly to determine the actual remaining life based on inspection findings and actual operating conditions, and these often determine that most equipment is safe to operate at age. However, with time, an increasing number of, of cases of, of the remnant life assessment recommend replacement or major refurbishment. This type of work invariably requires uh, a turnaround for this replacement. The second major driver for these new style of turnarounds is changing regulatory requirements, especially environmental laws and carbon emission targets. These lead to many regulatory compliance investment projects that also require to be completed in turnarounds. Also, the recent changes to business environment for oil-based transport fuels such as the move away from diesel motor fuel also lead to changes in oil refinery configuration and hence investment projects require completion during turnarounds. In some recent turnarounds, the percentage of work associated with design changes and projects uh, and asset replacements has reached 65% of the total work scope. As such, the whole event takes on a different emphasis and requires a completely different skills profile and mindset. The design, procurement and planning period is also extended to between two and four years, and the size and type of preparation team is quite different to that found on a traditional open, clean and inspect turnaround. There will be engineering construction, procurement sub-teams, in addition to the turnaround planning team. The modifi modification scope will involve significant pre-turnaround works. All sensible and safe opportunities should be taken to complete works pre-turnaround, so as a as to minimize the amount of work to be executed in the turnaround period. This work can extend for up to 12 months pre-turnaround, often involves civil engineering, setting foundations, structural modifications, and installing of vessels and running new pipe runs through the plant. 
This work will invariably be executed within a live operating process plant and thus will require robust construction management and safety controls. The turnaround execution period for these improvement turnarounds is normally longer than a traditional open clean and inspect turnaround and can often be between five and ten weeks depending upon the scope of work. As such, they have a major impact on the company's operating business plan due to loss production of between 10 and 20% for the year concerned. Significant and varied engineering challenges exist in these events, which we will now explore. The contribution of a qualified mechanical engineer can be wide and varied and will include leadership and management. Mechanical engineers in the oil refinery turnarounds often act as the hub about which the other disciplines circulate. As such, mechanical engineers are key to the success of the whole event and often provide the leadership required. Good quality design, both conceptual and detail, is essential to successful events. Efficient construction methodologies need to be de designed in early to the process so that turnaround duration can be optimised. Procurement of new engineered equipment requires significant input from qualified engineers. There are many other engineering functions. These are just a few and will not just be one engineer delivering the above. There will be a mixed team with different skill sets adding value to their part of the process. And hence the overall event as such. There will need to be excellent teamwork in between the engineers with focus on the overall end result. Now we're going to move on to some case studies to show typical examples. These, these are all engineering challenges that I encountered in my career. The real case studies, and as such, I shall avoid providing technical data. Instead, I shall concentrate on the engineer's decision making and input to the solutions developed. These case studies all involved mixed engineering teams from client organizations, contractors, specialist consultants, and suppliers. Now, the first of the three case studies is the replacement of an air cooler structure. Air coolers are used extensively across oil refineries where forced draft air is pushed up through a bank of thin tubes to cool down the hydrocarbon inside the tubes. The banks themselves are about 40 foot long and normally located at elevation. The second, second case study I'll look at is the failure of a nozzle on an aged plant. This was an event found during a turnaround, i.e. discovery work. This can often be the most challenging engineering with real-time pressure on the engineers to rectify the problem. And here's a picture, we'll come on to more detail later, but here's a picture of a crack in a nozzle. And finally, the final case study I'll look at will be a case of contrasting two methods for replacing FCCU regenerated cyclones, which uh, will be dealt with at the end. Okay, so moving on to the first case study. A little bit of background for the air coolers. These air coolers were aged assets. Uh, it, they're in a coastal location with salt water helping to create the structure. They were operating well past the design life, and there have also been significant changes in the uh, pressure equipment design code since the original construction. And there were multiple process improvements required, additional cooling capacity for both increased flow rates and improved product quality requirements. In addition, there was also a need to improve reliability and maintainability of the fans, the motors, and the speed reduction drives. So that gave a pretty big motivation for a project. Right. The challenges encountered by the engineering team involved were that the internal client management in-house design team was somewhat committed to a lot of other projects at the time. This, this limited the amount of engineers available, so it had to be a different strategy for this than just using internal engineers to design and procure. It was a very short duration to complete the turnaround scope. The process unit was one of the very last units to shut down and one of the very units to start up. As such, there was less than three weeks to complete the replacement work. And finally, the coolers we're in a very congested area, local, with work areas either side. And there's very, very limited space around the area. As such, it was necessary to install the new coolers in exactly the same place as the existing coolers. There was no real opportunity to build a whole new structure nearby. Uh, and finally, with all work in 
turnarounds, one of the issues was multi-level working and working at height. Uh, and the design had to reflect this and make sure that the constructible, it was constructible in the short periods available. Now, looking at the uh, challenges for the work, so the solution developed included, in, included lots of challenges. Now, these two photographs just give a bit of background. Here's the one on the left hand side is one of the old cooler banks being removed. That gives you an indication of how large they are. And the one on the right is showing the removal of the existing corroded structure. Uh, and it just gives a bit of a background to the size and scale of this task. Now, moving on to how we tackle this. The first uh, aspect was to look at the contractual arrangements for the uh, for the works. The solution for the contract we looked at first was to engage a, a specialist contractor. Due to the limited engineering support available from the site project team, it was decided to engage a specialist air cooler vendor for the design and supply. They spent a significant amount of time on site carrying out surveys to optimize the design. In order to manage the interactions with other turnaround scope, it was also decided to assign the construction work to the main mechanical contractor. This is standard practice in turnaround management, but required the contract selection process for the main mechanical contractor to consider the construction skills required for the scope of work. The, a third party contract was also involved for the piping design because the air cooler vendor didn't have the in-house resources to do piping design, so this was retained with a third-party piping design contractor. The new equipment uh, was of greater mass than existing due to the need for additional cooling surface area and changes in design code requirements, so the structure below required a design assessment. Once again, modern Eurocode structural design requirements are more conservative. The results of the assessment was a requirement to enhance the foundations requiring excavation between pumps on an operating plant with mass poured reinforced concrete to create larger foundations. All this work was completed prior to the turnaround and involved civil and structural engineering. Uh, and obviously within a live operating plant there's a significant challenge. What we also utilised is a critical fit laser survey and 3D modelling to set out the design for the new structure allowed the piping design to be optimized for turnaround construction, i.e. we wanted to maximize the pre-turnaround fabrication and optimize the number of field wells in the piping runs. All the piping runs were designed to be where possible on the outside of the structure to allow pre-fabricated spools to be installed as very large pieces uh, to make, make the actual turnaround execution much more efficient. Now, the choice of installation of this sort of equipment is either piece small or piece large. Piece small being when you put up the individual pieces of steel and bolt it all together in situ, or piece large where you build a module. The decision was made to build into four modules, each module with four fan units in each. So this permitted piece large construction with significant efficiency improvements. These improvements involved simple landing structure for each of the modules, the mated with the module supports. These were built pre-turnaround. Setting of the location was complex as the locations of the supports needed to avoid clashes with existing pipelines in the pipe rack below, but also maintaining sensible supports on the module that did not compromise the module's structural design or overcomplicate it. The installation of the fans, bearings, motors, and belt drive system was all pre-turnaround in the modules, and installation of all lighting inside the modules with their cable runs for a coil back was installed pre-turnaround. The module itself also included a full width fan deck platform within the module. This was at higher elevation of the existing module's walkways. The previous walkways also acted as pipe supports for the line work below. We did not want to remove them, so we just need to remove handrails and grating, and we left the remaining structure underneath the new modules. Crane planning. Uh, was a, also quite a significant task because of the local area and the a adjacent works. The crane planning had to optimize the load slew path and minimize the re relocation of the crane. 
The module design and the design of the module support pads allow for a very prompt release of the load from the crane. At the UK coastal location, there are often periods of high wind, so the time with the modules on the crane hook needs to be as short as possible. Large modules such as these are susceptible to wind effects due to the shape and sail area. The final area of improvement and optimization was once again working with uh, the electrical instrumentation team. The electrical instrument cable routing was designed to minimize turnaround scope. All the lighting and motor circuits were fully cabled up on the, each module with cable ends cord back. New junction boxes were installed into the existing structure below so that the cables could be terminated off as soon as the module was landed and secured. This, for example, permitted the lighting circuits to be energized promptly, and as the construction work was executed 24 hours a day, the lighting was needed. It also permitted early testing of the cables and early commissioning of the 16 drive circuits, which due to the increased cooling requirements, all required new switch gear and new cabling. So, this next photograph shows uh, a module being lifted. And from that module, you can see uh, the size, the scale. You can see the full deck fan, fan deck, where you walk into the fan as one complete deck. Uh, the nine support legs are just visible at the bottom of the module. The lighting can just be seen already mounted on the module, and the cable trays are already in. So the whole module is built and complete, with the exception of the actual process coolers and pipework. Uh, the option to install the actual process cooling bundles uh, was explored, and it was decided not to pursue that route because the size of crane inch required would have made it uh, far more complicated. Uh, and the actual time to land the modules on top of these, the, the coolers on top of the modules, is quite short. If we look at the next photograph, this is this shows the, the piping arrangement. Now here's an example of where the pipe work was as a result of the 3D modeling and later surveying, and the piping designs being external to the structure, it's possible to install significantly large piping spools with a quite a large amount of prefabrication, uh, minimizing to just the field welds, the one visible right in front of the picture there. Okay, so, that, so that was an example, and all hung on the outside of the structure to allow it to be installed promptly and efficiently. Uh, and the final photograph is a view from above looking down on the on the modules where you can see the at the distance you can see those four nice new modules with all that fin fan bundles on top. Uh, and it shows the complexity and the congestion in the in the work area. So once again there's a multidiscipline team on this covering covering almost every maintenance discipline you can see on site on an oil refinery. Well, the next case study is a uh, nozzle failure. So, as I say, we'll, we'll, this is an aged piece of plant. It was it was an old plant, uh, seen some many years of service, and th this was discovery work. As I say, this this was found uh, during a turnaround, during the very early stages of the turnaround. The cracking was in a very large diameter pipe within the nozzle. Uh, it had both internal and external refractory lining, and this nozzle linked the reactor riser to the internal cyclones and operated at temperatures in excess of 500 degrees C. Now, uh, the, there was no option but to repair this. Further propagation of the crack would have been a threat to the operation of the plant, and if the crack had propagated towards the vessel, it would have compromised the pressure containment of the vessel and re resulted in emergency shutdown. So there was no option... The repair had to be actioned in the turnaround, and there was only two or three weeks to do this work. Now, obviously, this posed a number of challenges, uh, including the fact that it was connected to a cyclone system. So this nozzle came across from outside the vessel into the vessel and connected to a cyclone system weighing in excess of 18 tonnes. As a result of this, the, the, the nozzle is fundamental to the support of the cyclone system. The failure mechanism also needs to be understood prior to action and repair as just replacing like for like or cutting out metal and welding metal back in wasn't an option because it could have resulted in a repeat failure. So where a normal, a normal sort of engineering investigation on something like this may take months,
months and the plan to put right may take months. This had to be executed in, investigated, solution developed and implemented in a matter of weeks. So on that photograph you can see the, the nozzle crack from the inside. Right. So the, the source of the, the, the challenge, the way forward was developed. We very, very quickly initiated a root cause analysis team. Uh, this, this was de determined that there was metal operator temperature issues. The analysis involved metallurgical analysis, which involved positive material identification of all items, the associated well metallurgy, and replication determined if creep me mechanisms were involved. Now, as a result of the metallurgical analysis, the failing mechanism analysis concentrated on material super suitability for the temperatures experienced and the effectiveness of the refractory linings in protecting the metal from the process temperature. The design review then revisited the design, including the cyclone support structure, and this educated the solution to be developed. Now, the solution developed had to involve a change of material to a chromoly chrom steel with a higher temperature uh, strength properties. The option was considered also included using further insulation to provide refractory, to provide uh, greater insulation effects. This was considered not feasible or to be a reliable solution due to the potential for refractory lining systems to fail. We also, once we decided to move up to a high grade of chrome moly steel, had to develop weld procedures and heat treatment procedures that would be suitable for work in such a confined space and also had to take due regard for the metallurgical state of the aged adjoining equipment we were welding onto. The chrome moly material for the replacement nozzle had to be procured, rolled to shape and seam welded. For this, because we were under time pressure, we used an experienced fabricator of cyclone systems as they had both suitable material in stock and had the in-house capability to roll, form and fabricate in a very short time available. The existing cyclone system had to then be provided with some temporary structural support during the repair. This support structure required sufficient flexibility to accommodate thermal movements during the post-weld heat treatment of the welds. Once all the engineering had been done, the nozzle was cut out and replaced. That sounds like the simple part of the process. And a refractory lining system had to be designed including a pouring nozzle for the internal refractory. The poured lining was considered to be a significantly more reliable option compared to a gunned lining, but it required a pouring nozzle that was then inside the vessel. This was all completed during a turnaround, and here's a picture of the final repair, showing the refractory installed, uh, the pouring nozzle with its blank fitted, and it also gives an indication of the uh, location difficulty and sort of the compactity of the of the location and how little space was available to do it. So that was a, a challenge with time pressure, but still required all the same skills that a, a, an engineer would engage normally. Right, so the third case study is a contrast of two different cyclone replacement methods. The... Uh, So by way of a background, the, a fluidized catalyst cracker unit has multiple cyclones to separate catalyst from flue gas in the regenerator. The flue gas temperatures are greater than 700 degrees C. The gas is moving around at very high velocity in the cyclones. And the combined flue gas and residual catalyst are extremely erosive. As such, the cyclone is normally made of 300 series austenitic stainless steel, with an erosion resistance lining. Regeneration vessels are normally carbon steel with insulated refractory lining, and depending upon the design uh, and operation of the cyclone, the life normally varies between 10 to 25 years. And in both these cases I'm going to talk about now, the cyclones have come to the end of their lives. However, the associated regenerator vessels were considered still to be fit for further service for several years. So, moving on to the challenges. So these included 
how to install very large, complex publications inside large vessels safely in minimum time. FCC units are extremely tall process units, often in excess of 70 meters, and invariably the cyclones are at the top of the regenerator vessel. And there's also, as with all turnarounds, the overall requirement to maintain safety during the turnaround and a need to minimize work at height and manage multi-level working. So this next sketch, nice drawing this actually, uh, shows parts of a cyclone structure. Essentially, uh, they are very, very similar to the cyclones found in some sort of uh, vacuum cleaners, but I can assure you they're significantly larger. There are normally primary and secondary cyclones. In this picture, the primary cyclones are on the outside and the secondary cyclones are on the inner radius. Now, moving on to our first option, which is to install the cyclones as a uh, piece small replacement. So piece small replacement means they're going in one at a time in lots of little bits. Now, the, the initial concept for this job considered that the vessel, the plant was a stacked vessel design. As such, above the regenerator was another vessel, and it was decided the upper vessel removal and then cutting the top off the regenerator access cyclones was not a viable option due to the size of crane is required and the impact on other scope in the other vessel, upper vessel. So in this case, it was decided to cut a temporary hole in the vessel side to route cyclones through, and this will become much clearer later. So, addressing our challenges, some of the challenges included uh, that there was a requirement in this case to increase the flue gas rates as the process unit could operate at higher rates provided the cyclones could cope with increased flue gas rates and hence velocities. This required larger cyclones, however there's very little spare space in the regenerator vessel to accommodate the larger cyclones. There were also significant adjacent works, including complete replacement of regenerator air grids below the cyclones, a major relining of the vessel, the regenerator vessel that contained the cyclones, and a nearby flue gas system replacement that required integrated construction planning. There are engineering solutions developed included the following. We utilized 3D modeling to maximize cyclone design within the existing vessel. The final design had absolutely minimal clearances between the cyclones, and in the development, all options within the existing vessel envelope were considered. The final design maintained the quantity of cyclones and their connection positions, but almost all other dimensions of details changed. Due to the decision to have larger and redesigned cyclones, uh, with obviously increased catalyst loading and increased self-weight. We, we carried out a fine amount of element analysis of the cyclone system, the existing vessel, and its ability to accommodate the increased loads. Out of this, we also then detailed the cyclone hangar support systems which were attached to the vessel. Once we had optimized our design, 3D construction sequence animations were developed and revisited and revised repeatedly to optimize the sequence removal and reinstatement and to select the optimum locations for the field wells and also develop scaffolding plans. Within the turnaround, we also utilize rope access technicians to attaching and detaching the rigging. This minimizes the uh, amount of scaffolding required within the vessel to be built and stripped and built and stripped. Now, the attached photographs show part of the constructed cycling system. Now, here we can see uh, this, the right-hand picture is earlier in the phase where the cyclone bodies are installed, and you can see the very, very tight clearance between them. Uh, the, on the right-hand side, you can see more of the cyclones assembled, i.e. their dust bowls have been attached, and then three or four of the dip legs have been attached. Uh, but that gives an indication of how tied to the environment of the vessel. It's what you can see in this vessel. is a complete new lining on the wall as well because the vessel had been, just been relined with the refractory. Now the next slide is an animation, a small section of the animation showing the, uh, the initial one is a, a small snapshot of the removal method.
and the second one is actually the installation method. So the destruction animation, from this you can see where we cut the vessel wall. So we cut the sheet out of the vessel wall with associated stiffening. The retroriser was conveniently removed at the same time. Uh, and you can see how the cyclone system was initially a scaffolding was built up through the structure. And then the sequence slightly accelerated here shows how the sections were removed from the vessel with a complex sequencing and, and, and with numerous iterations to optimize the sequencing. Uh, and obviously, the goes into a lot more detail. But that's, that's a type of modeling. That was just a very, very short snapshot of the modeling. Now, the next video sequence also shows the construction, which uh, you can see from a, an empty vessel here, still with the outer frame and the scaffolding built in it. This is how the sequence was started for the installation. Cyclone bodies themselves were inserted upside down and swung around through the sheet to aid rigging. These are the ex that's in a primary cyclone going on the outside, paired up with that secondary that's already just been installed. Each cyclone was installed the same in the same sequence. With the exception of the very last cyclone, which was not installed because the room was required, as you'll see soon. Why we never inst we we re left the re sort of installation of the very last secondary cyclone until later. So the vast majority of the cyclones are nearly installed, and the gas riser pipe pipes are installed. So say this video is somewhat edited to take out a lot of the detail. But at this point, we have one cyclone body not installed. The hangar system is being shown installed, being installed there. And then we move on to the next phase, which is the installation of dust bowls and dip plugs. So at this point in time, very long dust bowl dip plug assemblies are being installed, utilizing the space left by the missing cyclone. Each of these are then installed as large pieces to minimize the amount of work in the turnaround. Now the final cyclone, when it was then installed, had to be, inst had to be installed in a lot more pieces with more air welds in it. But it was decided that was the optimum way to do it to allow 90% of the work to be installed efficiently and one to be installed uh, slightly slower. Right, so that's the piece small type solution. Very, very time consuming, a lot of man hours on the job in the vessel, control of multi level work in the vessel. However, it didn't require massive drainage, it didn't require a great deal of facilitation work. Now, the second option we're going to come on to now is the piece large replacement. Now, piece large replacement, a uh, completely different type of type of project. Now, the advantage was that this was a side by side FCC design, which means it was a standalone regenerator vessel. So, removing the vessel top was a viable option. The challenges still have plenty of challenges. To actually lift the vessel top was a very large and very heavy lift. There's limited space near the plant for the work, and such a heavy lift is always a threat from crane wind restrictions. Once again, being a coastal UK location, wind restrictions, high winds are always an issue. So, a snapshot of some of the engineering solutions developed included uh, listing list of complete lift of the complete cyclone system and vessel head in one go, maximizing the pre turn and dressing of the new head, critical fit surveying. So here's our region head as it's being lifted. Now that is just the complete head with all its cyclones in. It has aluminum scaffolding built into it for the access in the lift. Uh, all the pipe work installed on the outside, just a few missing pieces. The detail of the aluminium scaffolding is shown on the 
on this slide, and we can see the aluminium scaffolding here, a small snapshot in the corner showing that the aluminium scaffolding it's got, uh, was built all the way around the outside and pre-hung inside the head, so it could be lifted into place really quickly. Now, this offered a great deal of engineering challenges and design work, but the Okay, so this video shows the removal of the regen head. Uh, it shows how the whole head was lifted out of one piece, sl slung around, and then uh, lowered down into a frame that was skidded away, uh, all completed in a very short period of time. Right, the second video now shows the installation of the new head. Firstly, you can see the complex skidding arrangement where the new head had to be brought across. Uh, the video shows the weight of the head, uh, and it was lifted up and positioned very carefully and accurately, and as you see the video, within, within a few millimeters final position. Uh, when that head was landed, it was welded into place. The welding process started with that shift because the aluminum scaffolding that had been designed inside could be positioned straight away. Uh, and the head was pre-assembled with all its lights on, and before the end of that shift, the lighting was all engaged and the lights were turned on. Okay, so the, there's a, what you can see from the rest of this video, uh, you see it's, quite avail it's available on YouTube, uh, so the address is given on the, there's just a small extract of a quite a long video shot from the whole turnaround, which is available for viewing by, uh, by you all. Okay, now moving on to a very short summary of your future skills needed in turnarounds. As I've, as I've described, turnarounds are changing massively. The, the skills needed in turnaround management now are mechanical core skills that cover strength of materials, structures, metallurgy, welding, and the ability to work with multidisciplined engineering knowledge with chemical process engineers, instrument electrical engineers, civil and structural and refractory engineers. The other skills needed in the modern turnaround world are engineering design skills, designed by code or regulation, ASME PED, for example, designed by analysis, finite element analysis, creep assessments, remnant life assessments, safety in design, has ops and has cons, and constructability in design, and above all, the ability to interpret or read drawings. Another one of the skills required is project management planning and scheduling, cost estimating, cost control, commercial and contractual management, and risk management. Leadership and management skills required in turnaround management are profession management of professional staff, management of a skilled workforce, and the ability to cope in a matrix organization where the team on the turnaround are often not directly reporting to you. And finally, the greatest aspect of a turnaround engine is personality person has to be organized, disciplined, calm under pressure, ability to prioritize, able to resolve conflicts, certainly not interested in a nine to five life, ability to cope with long working hours, stamina, and the ability to cope with an outdoor environment, working at heights and in confined spaces. So for all engineers with those skills who want to move into turnaround management, the routes, the routes into turnaround management are multiple. Plant operations, the plant operators, the clients, the oil companies, gas companies, chemical companies, the EPCM contractors, the big design houses, they have massive input into these projects. The uh, technical service contractor specialists, all those, those big cranes you saw in those videos, they all employ multiple engineers. Uh, and the main mechanical contractors, the big service contractors to do the engineering work also require engineers. So as a career, the modern turnaround world is a far more exciting life than it was in early days. As I say, 27 years of doing this, it has got more challenging for engineering. And as a final, so basically when you can't work each day, have you had a good day at the office? Turnaround management can give you days like this. Okay, it's not the average day for turnaround engineers, but it's certainly a good day. And it's a good career to be in. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much for watching that. We've got a number of uh, questions, four or five really uh, good questions come in. If I can just take them out, I'll just take them in uh, any particular order. Uh, one of the questions is, which for the nozzle failure, which fitness for service uh, requirements do we follow often? And it, it varies depending on the operating site, but oil refiners tend to operate to the uh, American Petroleum Institute code, so that'd be API 571. It's actually very similar to AS, that was me, FFS1. There's also a British Standard Fitness for Service Code, BS7910, which is used more in the uh, chemical industries and other industries, but as I say, the oil oil and gas industry tend to operate under the API codes. Uh, now, uh, there's come a very good observation here. What I asked what inspection technique was used on the main head welds. You saw the uh, gentleman welding in the video. On the main head well one of the issues with big welds on turnarounds is the uh the time if we if we do radiography the the fact that the radiography exposure takes so long we have to clear the whole unit for a large area and so nowadays we're starting to use a lot more of the advanced ultrasonic uh techniques uh preparation time is longer for advanced ultrasonics but it doesn't it is not so disruptive of the uh, neighboring work but it also gives a, a evidence-based uh, volumetric uh inspection which is uh, to satisfaction of code now on a quite a different topic a uh, quick question about what planning and scheduling tools we use in major turnarounds now over the years the planning and scheduling tools available have improved and changed but I would say over the last uh, eight or ten years it's very much dominated by Primavera P6 as a scheduling tool uh, it's a piece of software produced by Oracle and it's quite quite well known within the construction industry uh, the actual planning and estimating tools used vary massively between clients and contractors. Uh, often, if the client has one, we'll define one planning and estimating methodology tool, uh, which means all contracts use it but on the site, but if not, there, there are often some contracts have their own tools, and that, that's how you estimate and plan the job. Now, the type of planning and estimating tools needed varies massively from the complexity of the turnaround. The major revamp project like the the couple of those examples and especially there's one in the video needs a very detailed uh, planning tool with the ability to look at different scenarios and in that case I'd say vast majority of people use Prime Vera P6 and, and a detailed step by step planning down to level five. Right. Uh now another a bit of a question. I think this is uh, relevant to most of the case studies. I mentioned we use uh, laser surveying and critical fit. Uh, surveying methods. Well, in one of the questions is how accurate have you found the laser surveying to be? And uh, to be honest, sometimes I find it to be very accurate, and sometimes not so accurate. But it all depends upon how much you invest in the in the pre turnaround preparation. The, the ability to build up a, a, an accurate three D model of the of the of the built plant, pre surveying the existing plant and the new equipment. Uh, that investment in accuracy pre turnaround will often reap massive benefits in the installation. Uh, obviously, any errors in surveying and size always ends up being modifications in the field, which are time consuming. Uh, th there are other aspects, obviously, oil refineries and gas plants off often operate at elevated temperatures, so thermal growth can impact uh, the accuracy. Uh, the ability to determine and estimate the thermal contraction, obviously the plant is cool during construction phase, uh, but often the 3D model has to be made and educated by laser scanning while the plant is operating in a temperature. Uh, so that can be a significant effect which you need to plan for. Now, with work inside vessels, 3D modelling is totally and utterly dependent upon your ability to correctly module the as-built condition inside the vessel. And older, older plants with many years of modifications, the internal details are often not as per the drawings. And a degree of uh, conservativeness is required in, in design work inside vessels. Uh, or when an opportunity is taken, accurate surveys should be taken of vessels when you're actually inside vessels as well at turn Right, uh, now for one on the last couple of slides, this is uh, quite a nice one. It's the uh, question about would I recommend uh, a young engineer to follow a career in turnaround management. Well, obviously, once I was a young engineer and I did follow a career in turnaround management. It it is a 
an exciting career, has plenty of opportunities. It does require people to have the correct skills, personality and characteristics to in, endure what's actually quite a difficult, uh, difficult career at times. Uh, but it's a career with some pretty big rewards in this as well, both both uh, sorts of in, in professional respect and um, financially. It's fairly rewarding financially as a career as well, mostly because it's actually not a pleasant an environment to work in. Uh, so yes, I would recommend young engineers seriously consider a career in turnaround management. The uh, there are lots of routes into that as I put in the slide. The, the people who are very much design skilled, the route can go through the design houses. If you're very much construction skilled, uh, the route can go through client or contractor routes. Uh, it's very much a, a matrix team organisation where people work together based on their skills and their skill sets. Uh, but it is definitely a career worth pursuing. Uh, as a young engineer who wants to be in industry, it's it's worth pursuing. Uh, so those are the that was, what, that was five five questions, five very useful questions submitted. What I would suggest is that if you look onto the slide and review the, the, the full video of the uh, turnaround, which I showed a very small snapshot of, uh, and also YouTube contains a very large number of videos from other turnarounds around the world, and you can get an indication of the type of engineering. What, what a video like that will never show you is the amount of engineering work that went behind the scenes quietly 24 months earlier in offices uh, and on computers, uh, and the engineering challenges and difficulty in discussing and producing the optimum solution. Uh, they just tend to show the, the end result. Okay, I hope this will be very useful to you. Uh, so we've just come to the end now uh, of the webcast and I'd like to thank you for, for listening and uh, contributing. Thank you very much. Bye.